Welcome everybody. My name is Tamara Williams and I am the Executive Director of PLU's Wong Center for Global Education and I'm especially excited to welcome partners today from PLU's Semester Gateway programs in China, Mexico, Namibia, Norway, Trinidad and Tobago, and the UK. It's absolutely delightful to see you all on the screen. I'm deeply grateful and actually really moved that we were able to create at least one opportunity to connect with all of you. I've realized uh, as we've navigated this very difficult time together, how uh, on some levels we take, or at least we take you for granted. Um, and I'm just so grateful because I do now know now more than ever that uh, if it weren't for the collaboration of each and every one of you, uh, our programs would not be as exceptional as they are. So welcome to you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm so, so glad you're here. And um, shortly the, our, our visitors will be introduced. Uh, before we move on, uh, there's a, a few things I would like to say, some other shout outs and um, moments of gratitude. I want to thank uh, those of you um, in our uh, Gateway Nations, especially that were able to work in your time zones uh, with our specifications. So Oni from Chengdu, China, thank you very much. I know it's like 1 or 2 a.m. for you at this moment. And Martha, I know you're 17 hours away. And, uh, Hilda as well. So thank you so much for making the effort to be here. Um, I also want to express my gratitude to Bryn Smith, who is our Gateway Program Manager. Uh, but we owe her uh, the idea of pulling this together. And uh, Bryn, I'm very thankful for that. And also her, her actually pulling it together uh, for us all. So thank you. And I'm also very grateful to Holly, who working with Heather Jacobson uh, in, in the area of international students coming to PLU, uh, pulled together the entire program for PLU celebration of International Education Week. Uh, her marketing and outreach has been exceptional. So thank you, Holly. And now we'll turn to the program. And in order to get us started, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of the panel, my colleague, Dr. Ami Shah. She will introduce our speakers. But first, a little bit about Ami. Dr. Ami Shah is Associate Professor of Global Studies and Anthropology at PLU. She holds a DPhil and MPhil in Development Studies from the University of Oxford and a BA in International Affairs from George Washington University. Her current research focuses on representations of the developing world in the humanitarian industry and decolonial approaches to international studies and pedagogy. Previously, Dr. Shah conducted research on urban change and identity in Nigeria and India. At PLU, she teaches courses focused on contemporary global issues, global development and international relations for global studies anthropology, political science, and international honors program. I would, remiss in, uh, be, I would be remiss in not stating finally that uh, Dr. Shah is also uh, PLU's program director for our Semester Gateway uh, program at Bjorknes University College in Oslo, Norway, and works closely, closely with Dr. Hilda Eliasson Restad, who is with us today. Ami, uh, I'm just so grateful you're here today. It's a pleasure to introduce you and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamara. I think that's the longest introduction I've ever had. Um, Wow, that, thank you for that quite generous introduction. So again, my name is Ami Shah. I teach in Global Studies in Anthro here at PLU. Um, and as Tamara said, I am the program director for our Gateway program in Oslo. I've also been a site director for our Oxford program um, and worked with the Global Education Committee. So these are all programs near and dear to my heart. And I would like to reiterate what Tamara said and just thank all of our partners on the ground for the work they do with our programs. Um, I know our students tend to come back and speak super highly of the coordination and the faculty that they meet, and we're just beyond appreciative for your work. All right, so I'm gonna ask the same question first for each panelist, and then they will have about five to six minutes or so to respond. If we still have time, I might engage with a follow-up question, but if not, 
we will move on. And then at the end, we'll open it up first for a question for all the panelists to kind of consider if they'd like to speak to it. And then finally, to some Q&A from the audience. So I'm going to begin with our Oslo program at Bjorkness College with Hilda Rustad, who's the Associate Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at Bjorkness College. Um, I will also add that Hilda is an expert on American foreign policy and the American elections and stuff. So we might have some fun follow-up questions for her later. <laughs> Hilda, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and yeah, could you tell us what COVID-19 has looked like in Oslo? What has the response been? How has it impacted your life? And also, has it impacted what you study or your profession at all? Oh, tiny, tiny questions. <laughs> tiny. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. Can I just first say that I miss you guys and uh, I really miss my PLU student crew because normally I would be getting ready for Thanksgiving now because my excuse for cooking Thanksgiving dinner is that I have PLU students on campus that I can invite home and it's always so much fun and it is so sad not to have any of my dear PLU students uh, with me. So that is maybe one of the biggest ways that COVID has impacted the way that I teach and the way that our, our little college runs is because the influx of Americans in the fall is always such a big event and uh, it always makes it better and more interesting and more international. So we miss it. Um, and of course, uh, other than that, it's the I, the thing that I assume is, is common for many uh, educators and, and humans uh, since March is that we've gone through a, a series of lockdowns and, and then reopenings and then sort of lockdowns again and then sort of reopenings again um, and fluctuating between all online digital uh, education and, and, and some uh, campus seminars. We, we opened hopefully in, in the fall by doing uh, some lectures online but then, then some seminars uh, on campus, especially for our first years, because we were very worried that incoming students who maybe are moving from other towns or from their parents' homes, you know, to Oslo, our capital, to start university for the first time, that they don't know anyone and that they need some social engagement. And so we had a sort of half open college um, to accommodate our, our incoming first years. And that was working uh, quite well for, for quite a while. But in November, uh, Norway experienced a sort of second wave. Uh, and since then, we've had to sort of close down uh, again and even, even end our, our tiny uh, campus uh, seminars. So I think um, our students understand, uh, and of course, we as educators understand, but um, it's, it's very challenging, and I think uh, one of the things that we focus on in Norway, because we have the luxury of focusing on this in Norway, because we have a welfare state that provides for everything else, is that we're focused on the sort of the psychosocial effects of isolation, of loneliness, of students being isolated in their tiny little uh, student housing units. Uh, and, and of course, other people also being isolated in their, their their own little houses or, or apartments and, and the effect that that can have long term on, on people's mental health. Uh, and so we're trying to do things like little online quizzes and, you know, coffee, you know, mid midday coffee hour on Zoom. Um, but uh, it, of course, is not the same. Um, so that's the sort of ed teaching and student part of it. In terms of, of my own professional um, life. I do, I research U.S. foreign policy and in Norway there's not that many people who have in-depth knowledge about uh, American politics and so I'm often used as a commentator on, on American politics and elections. And this year I had planned several trips to the U.S. to make sure that I was connected to what was going on to sort of credibly be able to, to comment uh, on the presidential election. But of course, all my hopes, all my trips were, you know, ceremoniously uh, canceled. And so I just, I feel more distant and distanced from uh, the U.S., which makes me sad because it's a country that I love and miss. Um, I lived there for nine years. My PhD is from the University of Virginia. 
And I'm, I'm getting, as I'm sure many of you are, just sort of angrier and angrier at this whole situation. And it's starting to feel like I really needed to end because I, I really miss my, my PLU students and I, I really miss my, my trips to the US. And, and I realize that these are all petty and small concerns in, in the big scheme of things. Um, but that's the report from Norway. All right, thank you, Hilda. I, I want to make sure to let you know that I see a few program alums are joining here as participants, so they might want to give you a shout out um, in the chat or something like that. Um, and I really appreciate this kind of idea of what does it mean when we have built a world that's built on connections, right? And then that suddenly is pulled apart. I'm wondering if you could just take one minute to talk a bit more largely about Oslo or Norway as a whole, as opposed to kind of just the university response and to think about how has the city or the country responded um, and what has that meant kind of for society as large, at large? Again, small question. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so we're only five million people uh, and we have, it's a political system with a high level of trust and a lot of money. So we are able to deal with the pandemic just fine, uh, but it, it's a pandemic, so, so, so it's, it's not fine. It, it's really challenging, even if you have a high level of trust in society and you have the money to deal with it, there are still lots of challenges. Uh, we, we only had one official lockdown where everyone had to stay at home. Uh, we're now in our, our second kind of semi-lockdown because numbers started climb again, climbing again. Um, and it, it, it's accompanied by the usual you know, discussions and, and debates and, and political controversies and, and this and that. But all in all, um, you see the benefits of living in a society with a high level of social trust because everyone is sort of pulling together, even though there are lots of disagreements and arguments. Everyone, agree, they agree on the goal and they agree on the facts. They agree that masks are important. They, they agree that social distancing is important. They agree that testing is important. This is, these aren't controversial issues in Norway as they are in the US. And so I really am, I can only imagine the challenges of trying to deal with a pandemic in a society that doesn't have a high level of social trust. All right, thank you so much for that. Let us move on to our Oaxaca program with Gloria, who's a professor of biology at Autonomous University of Oaxaca and a conservation biology professor for our Oaxaca Gateway program. Gloria, same question for you. How has COVID impacted your life um, in your area? And also how has it affected what you do, what you study or your profession? Yes, of course. Um, first, I want to say, uh, sorry for my English, I continue learning this language. And thank you for that. And thank you for inviting me. Um, COVID-19 um, has brought big changes to my life. At the personal and family level, it has been a hard experience because I haven't had much physical contact with my relatives, especially with my parents who are vulnerable people. At the profession level, I have experienced big changes too. Now my classes are online, but it is important to mention that in Mexico, and particularly in Oaxaca, many students don't have a personal computer or don't have internet at home to take the classes, study, or to their homework. So it is difficult to have classes under those conditions. In my opinion, having face-to-face -face and practical activities are determining elements in the teaching learning process, at least for biology topics, and also for programs uh, where there are resident students, trips, and cultural exchanges, such as PLU uh, gateway programs. I think that this year, the pandemic took away all these opportunities. Um, more broadly, the role of the biologists in this pandemic is fundamental. Um, research, prevention, and control are some of the areas in which biologists can help fight viruses. 
and zoonotic diseases, and some other natural imbalances. Uh, for example, global warming, climate change, species extinction, deforestation, etc. Um, in this case, this coronavirus is zoonotic, uh, which means that the virus was originated in animals and then transmitted to humans. So the biologists can help investigate the origin, pathogenesis, genetic variability about this coronavirus. Nevertheless, in Mexico, the work and experience of the biologists has not been uh, sufficiently consulted or valued. I think that the current administration has considered uh, the role of the scientists and experts some more than the previous administration, but mostly medical professionals. However, I hope that biologists will be included more and more in the future. Thank you so much for that, Gloria. Uh, no need to apologize for your English. I think we all here feel that uh, being multilingual in and of itself is a skill to be applauded, right? It's not necessarily an easy thing. So that was wonderful. I also appreciate um, bringing the focus to something that we often don't talk about, right? Which is the inequality, like the access to computers, to internet, et cetera. And I'm wondering if, um, if the state of Mexico has done anything to try to address some of these inequalities or not. I know this is a big kind of contestation among some school districts in Tacoma, but it really varies, right? Depending on what area that you live in, in some areas it's totally fine, but if you live in kind of a lower income area, this has been an issue as well. Did I lose you, Gloria? Are you still there? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, the government um, has um, don't don't have uh, sufficient equipment and the infrastructure for the students. And the students have many problems because they, uh, their families have not uh, money for buy computer and buy service to internet at home. So many students are um, working for um, alone. Yeah. I am, thank you for that. Um, I know in my field of development studies, that's one thing that we're talking about now, right? Like how being pushed out of education because of not having access is pushing um, kids essentially into places where they might never return to education and they're just going to work, et cetera. Um, thank you again. Let's move to Trinidad and Tobago, where hopefully it's a bit nicer weather than it is here in Tacoma today. Um, so we have Candace Hughes, Begonshe, uh, who's the site coordinator for the Trinidad and Tobago Gateway Program. Hello, Candice, how are you? Hey, hi, Dr. Hey. Shaw. Shaw. How are you? Yeah. Well. So same question, right? What is pandemic life like in Trinidad and Tobago and how has it affected your work? Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's afternoon where I am at. I really appreciate this opportunity to share with the PLU community and others worldwide um, the experience that we have been having here in Trinidad and Tobago. Whereas this might be a shared experience globally, we are all impacted. I, I really appreciate hearing from the different panelists about what's happening in this specific area. So I really thank you all for this opportunity to present. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected us across the globe and the Caribbean is not exempt. In Trinidad and Tobago and within the region, we totally understand that being a small island developing state 
that we have very limited resources and we also understand the fact that our medical and health facilities and services are also very limited as well. And so as a region, we really had to be very aggressive in the manner in which we dealt with the pandemic. Um, instantly, we locked down our borders in Trinidad and Tobago, and they're still closed at this point in time. The only persons that are allowed to come in are nationals, and they have to go through an exemption process. And the only persons able to leave are non-nationals, also going through a very long and lengthy process with flights very limited to get out of the country. Our students had to leave immediately in the month of March, and it was very abrupt and very challenging because it was the first time in my years of running the program on the ground, this being my 12th year, that students had to leave in the middle of it. So it was quite emotional for them and for myself, but understanding that we were in unprecedented time, I really applaud the Wong Center and PLU for the work that they did in terms of seeking the student safety and security first and getting them out. Since then, borders have been closed, and it meant that we had to be very aggressive on the island in terms of our response. We had challenges in dealing with that response and our borders being that we are surrounded by water, and our proximity to Venezuela and South America really posed a challenge for us to keep the illegal immigrants out who could easily just board a canoe or a boat and come across. And so we are still challenged by that, um, even up to today, and they have that illegal immigrants coming in has really been coined as being the reason why we had a second wave because with our borders closed, no one going out really, no one coming in, we then found ourselves in a second wave and a complete lockdown in the first instance and then a semi-lockdown in the second instance. It has really impacted our culture. It's the first time in outside of the years of war and outside of the outbreak of polio that we are facing no carnival in 2021. And one would ask, what does that mean for our artists? What does that mean for our program? What does that mean to me being someone who deals within the cultural industry? It has really impacted myself, my family, and persons within that cultural industry very, very, very much. I developed my company, my brand, Exquisite in 2016, and first we would do tours and excursions and destination management and see about our PLU students every year. In 2018, I branched out and expanded my horizontal scope and started to transport services. 2020 has arrived and the COVID-19 pandemic has hit and both of those streams of income have come to a halt, like a complete halt. Borders are closed, no one is going anywhere, renting any cars or doing anything like that. And so it really pushed me within my area of study and culture to really think outside of the box. I had to become creative and innovative as an entrepreneur to expand even further. So much so that I have now started to do exquisite liquors. And I've started to create a local liquor called Sorrel Liquor. Sorrel is a local plant here in Trinidad and Tobago that only blooms around Christmas time. Christmas is synonymous with Sorrel. So I have married that love for Christmas and that, that only availability of soil around Christmas time with that cultural side of parang and music and our love of liming and hanging out with friends and family and created this new product. And what the COVID-19 pandemic has really shown us as a country is that we need to do more to invest in our local um, entrepreneurs and our local businesses. We have now seen an emergence of local industries flourishing throughout Trinidad and Tobago and throughout the region, where people who are creative, people who are innovative, have realized, hey, next year I can't be a sailor for carnival, or I can't dance, or I can't sing in the traditional way. How can I use my creative talents to still become an entrepreneur and to push my brand, my business, and who we are as a culture? And so you've seen people making things, making straw hats, and not selling to foreigners who would be coming in to buy those, but actually serving the needs of our locals, serving the needs of our Tobagonians. People are now doing staycations. We don't have to go to the U.S. I was planning to go to the U.S. for the summer vacation. I can't go to the U.S. anymore. So you know what? I'm going to go to Tobago. So staycations have become a huge thing within the Caribbean region. And we have realized that we can bolster and create a more robust economy on the ground within our cultural creative industries and that's what we are doing 
Travis, that sounds fascinating, especially because a lot of the narrative here, right, is how small businesses, local businesses are being shut down due to COVID, especially because of how our government has handled it and, you know, losing out to big chains and stuff. So it's really, um, I think, fascinating to know that there are alternatives, right? There's other ways that this could be happening. Yeah. Wonderful. Let's move. Just We're just going to continent hop here. We're going to go all the way to Namibia, um, where we have Martha Kawashukufa, who is a deputy dean in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences there. Welcome, Martha. Again, thank you for being with us despite the time difference. Um, thank you very much for, for having me and um, for this invitation. I'm very honored. Um, um, and also uh, uh, to allow me an opportunity to to share my experience uh, personally and uh, professionally. Um, I must say uh, COVID-19 really caught us off guard um, as a country and it really impacted us um, significantly personally and uh, professionally. So uh, like many, many countries, I can imagine, everything was closed. Almost everything was closed, except maybe for basics. Maybe you go to a pharmacy to get medicine, but the schools, the restaurants, everything was closed. One, uh, a niece of mine was so stressed, and she, she was like, everything else is, everything is, uh, the only thing that is open is nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that means, <laughs> or maybe it's uh, typically in English, but basically saying nothing was, was open. So now we were forced as, a, as an institution to, to, to focus or to start with online learning and teaching, remote and distancing, uh, distance teaching. And this highly exposed us as an institution how unprepared we were. And uh, uh, like uh, some people that have talked about, I think it was Gloria, um, issues of connectivity. A lot of students don't even have Wi-Fi at home. Um, very basic or poor digital skills, uh, academics and, uh, and students. And access to basic things as, such as electricity, especially in the rural areas. So students that were locked down at their villages, uh, it was enough not having Wi-Fi, even worse that we don't even have electricity. So we, we were really heavily impacted to the ex uh, extent that the first semester, um, our students did not even do exams. They, they were given only uh, assessment and we had to do remedial teaching uh, for about two weeks just to cater for those students that really had no, no, no opportunity whatsoever. So financially also the, the university and the government had to divert money to address a lot of issues. Um, the university was given money to, to provide subsidized um, um, a portable Wi-Fi uh, um, or pocket Wi-Fi, as we call it here, and it, yeah, it really caught us off guard. I, I, that's that's I can say. Um, one impact uh, that I'm I'm still to feel um, is that we will not have PLU students uh, next year um, in January because that was a very familiar experience, they come, and, and, and not just at the university level, because they, they arrive in Namibia even before the university comes, or before the university opens, so they, they don't live very far from where we live, so they would walk to our house, um, I would cook some um, local food, or take them to local outlets to eat um, our food, so I, I think it, it's it's not just weird, it will be quite sad to say the least because the students, um, they literally also become part of our, of our family structure, so to say. So we, we will obviously miss them and I'm sure the kids will start asking, 
what happened to the students um, that they don't come anymore. And in terms of research, um, um, we, we have a, I don't know how to put it, generally, um, at least in Namibia, social sciences is not um, a priority, so to say. So a little bit of funding that is there, it, it's given to what you might want to say hard science and less towards uh, humanities and social sciences. So there is also that, in, uh, that impact in terms of, um, um, of, of, of research. Uh, personally, um, as I said, we were unprepared. Uh, in January, we were hearing of a virus in Wuhan. And in March, we had the first case in Namibia. So there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, uncertainty. Uh, we did not know the behavior of the virus, if I can put it that way. So there was a lot of anxiety. You don't know what to do and you don't know what to behave. And we also lost a lot of uh, contact. We personally were not even allowing people to come and visit us. We were not visiting people. Um, for a couple of months, I couldn't visit my mother who is um, 98. So you stay away from vulnerable people. So. We also had a couple of lockdowns, uh, two lockdowns with very strict curfews that if the curfew starts at, at five or at six, there's police in the street. So you have no chance of, you know, dodging. So we were confined to our houses, but we also got to then start exercising because when you're confined um, at home, you must find a way to, to break the stress. So, we started exercising about walking about five kilos um, a day. So we have continued. So I think that's a good thing that comes out of it. Um, the other thing, kids also got used to us uh, working from home. So, but now with small kids, it's, it's a challenge. You yes. have to say, if you're in a meeting and there's a little one, uh, Jen knows her, he's actually named after Jen, she would peep in. Can, can I greet your colleagues? I just want to say hi. So <laughs> <laughs> you also have to get to working from home. Um, and now once we got back to the office around end of August there, she started complaining. But why are you going to the office? You can work from home. I've seen you working from home. Why, why are you yeah. going to the office? Yeah. So those type of... of, of, of uh, things. But we also really, in a way, got to learn... Uh, how to live with the virus and um, uh, luckily none of um, us got uh, um, COVID or um, got infected. So already that, that that's, that's also enough, just not being infected because you don't know what would yeah. happen when you get infected. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, Martha. I, I'm really feeling the sympathy with children. So you can kind of maybe tell behind me, this used to be uh, my daughter's room, but we kicked her out to make this into an office. Um, and the baby is sleeping next door. So we're hoping if you guys hear crying, it's because she's waking up. So I, I totally understand that situation. Let us move north to Oxford and welcome our site coordinator for the IHON Gateway Program in Oxford, the IHON Oxford Gateway Program, Evan Easton Calabria. Hi Evan, it's good to see you. Hello, nice to see all of you, nice to be with you. Um, I too, I can continue the train of this is our <laughs> other bedroom that is no longer the twins bedroom, it's my yoga studio, my work studio, etc. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I'm um, American. I've been based in Oxford for almost nine years now. This has definitely been the strangest year of being based in Oxford that I can say. Um, I'm based at the Department of International Development at the Refugee Studies Center. And I also have the wonderful opportunity to wear the hat of the on-site coordinator for the Oxford IHON program. So I usually, um, I guess would be kind of wrapping up, well, a few more weeks of the program, but have um, get to have time with students, kind of helping them settle in, dealing with kind of academic issues or challenges and emotional, um, and just getting to hang out for group dinners and so on. So obviously none of that happened. Um, I can say that in terms of the UK and 
COVID, things went slowly. And anyone here who was part of the March, part of the program who then left very suddenly in March um, would be able to attest to that, that I'd say that there's been a very slow response, maybe not quite as slow as the US in certain places, um, but really challenging that a lot of people were reading a lot and wondering why lockdown hadn't started and so on. And suddenly Oxford went very quiet. So most of the students went home and we've been remote working and so on. Um, so it's starting to liven up again, which is a little bit bad, I suppose, because the case numbers are going up and I think this is the story that we're hearing. Um, so it's been interesting being in Oxford. I will say it was kind of an amazing experience walking down High Street with all these big, beautiful buildings and being the only one on the street and recognizing that's something that probably very few people have experienced in the last hundreds of years in Oxford. Um, so my work with refugees is mainly in East Africa. So in terms of my kind of work itself, obviously it shifted remotely. I had actually just been in Uganda in February. So probably if I had traveled there two weeks later, I wouldn't, I would have had to cancel my trip. It was at that time that I thought like, is it, is it okay that I'm getting on an airplane and thinking it was kind of weird to see people in masks in the, you know, airports and so on. So um, definitely times changed quickly. So at that point, um, Seattle, Washington had just, I remember, um, had just announced its first cases. And so I remember sitting in this little uh, kind of shack eating this amazing Ugandan meal with my co-researchers who are Ugandans and South Sudanese and being like, oh my gosh, that's my hometown that's being talked about on CNN. Um, and then my research itself obviously has been remote and has sort of shifted in the sense that a lot of my work looks at urban refugees, so refugees that aren't in the camps that we often envision but are, real, are in the cities and often aren't publicly seen or really allowed to be in cities. So what I found out very quickly through my researchers who are mainly refugees and then through the work we were doing was just how precarious their lives were, that it was um, very kind of people that had already been living hand to mouth suddenly didn't have that small bit of livelihoods of informal trade and so on. And this is obviously an issue that we're seeing all around the world in various kind of levels of, um, of challenge and direness and so on. Um, but it became very, very clear and refugees in Uganda initially weren't being offered um, national access to sort of f emergency food rations. So anyone in the city um, should have been offered that, but refugees weren't. And so really had no recourse to kind of basic necessities. And that did end up changing. Um, but that's something that came through really clearly in my research um, in the cities that I'm conducting research in. And then what was pretty amazing is also at the same time kind of examining this other strand of my research, which is the organizations that refugees themselves have created and um, seeing refugees jump into action and using their organizations to fundraise in order to feed people, in order to kind of sensitize other refugees about um, COVID in their own national language because nothing was publicly available in certain places and so on. So really seeing quite remarkably the work that was being done by refugees and at the same time just the incredible challenges that um, are definitely continuing even though lockdowns have loosened up in a lot of East Africa. Uh, maybe I'll leave it there, but happy right. to talk more at any point. <laughs> All right, thanks, Evan. I'm just keeping my eye on the clock, so I'm gonna move on so we have some time um, at the end for everyone. But I'm gonna move to Oni, hello. A wonderful PLU alum. Hello, are you there? He's hello. the former, yeah, he participated in the Chengdu Gateway Program and he's a current English teacher in Chengdu, China right now. Um, welcome, I guess, virtually back to PLU, Oni. Uh, I, I, I would like to first say thank you to, uh, from the invitation of being able to participate among so many amazing people that I've admired since a, a year ago as I was a student. So to offer any insight from where I am right now is a, is a privilege and an honor. So my uh, experience is a little different as I am directly related and uh, affected by China. So I'm situated in Chengdu, China, which is about in the middle uh, Southern China. And so if any of you don't know about um, Spring Festival, Spring Festival, I want to talk first about um, a little bit about the nature of the event that happened in China so that I can better explain how that affected me. So 
in essence, uh, in December, uh, that is when um, Dr. Lee, uh, in about December, he discovered the virus in uh, Wuhan. And um, I just want to give honor to him because without him, it uh, notifying uh, and informing, it could have been a much later announcement um, by China. But during Spring Festival, this is an event that happens every year. It's the start of the lunar calendar. Uh, so it's the transition to the new year of the lunar calendar. And during this event, it's about two weeks to four weeks, depending on one's job, where they can travel or return home and visit family. And during this time, as I don't have family in China, I decided to um, travel abroad. So I actually visited another PLU alum who's teaching English in Vietnam. Um, and I remember I was in Vietnam when I got the first messages on the Chinese social media app, uh, WeChat. And so I started receiving uh, the first, I think the second day I was in, so this was about January 20th, I started receiving small messages and uh, saw the news. And so I was, I guess some of the, I was um, receiving notifications via text, not about the virus, not just from the news as many people are uh, learning about the virus. So to hear um, anecdotal stories from coworkers, from my friends and all of my community back in Chengdu, and about a week into my uh, vacation in Vietnam, I actually, uh, my whole break got extended. And then, so instead of returning on February 20th, it would be March 20th, a whole nother month. And what happened is a week after that, so two weeks into Spring Festival, uh, the Chengdu, actual Chengdu, uh, went under quarantine. So the city that I was residing in went into quarantine. So I had an option of either returning back for the undecided future, not knowing if I have a job or pay, or if I make a choice to return to America. And fortunately, my uh, Chinese company, they empathized, they empathized with me and they allowed um, some pay to support me to return home. And so <clears throat> actually, I returned home uh, during the quarantine period in China. So I was only in China for one day during the quarantine period. Uh, and similar to what the last speaker said, walking through Oxford um, or walking uh, in China alone, which is usually a city populated by 15 million people uh, where no one is on the road is, is an eerie feeling. Um, and I returned home, and then now I want to talk about when I came back to China, because now I'm here now. Um, and I'm not sure all of you are in your respected countries right now. And I imagine the news that goes around wherever you are is, is mainly focused on the area that you're situated in, yes. And so it might maybe, uh, I'm learning so much about all of these different places that I don't receive the news here in China. So I hope to shed some light on what's currently happening here. So basically I returned to China uh, in mid-March. And uh, when I returned, I actually had to do quarantine for three, three weeks in a hotel. And after I got out of the quarantine, this is when I really started to experience China after Chengdu started to open up. And so the main things that I experienced profession-wise is that I actually had another two months that the, the, the school I was at did not open. So I was unemployed, hoping that the school would be opening up, but all of it was online learning. And online learning for young children is incredibly difficult, and I had to adjust and adapt to that. Uh, furthermore, to be... Uh, China has a population of 1.4 billion people and has 56 different racial groups. And one of the racial groups is the Hanzu or the, the Han racial group. And this has about 90% of the population. So the reason I point that out is uh, if you're not Han, you're in the minority. And to be a foreigner in China is also to be a minority where I'm living. And there was definitely some experiences being a minority that were very difficult 
um, including restaurants not accepting um, me or my friends or even coworkers, um, as well as different mandates and laws that went into effect that actually negatively affected me, uh, including uh, the necessity to have health codes, but there was no health codes made for foreigners. So many different places would not allow uh, myself to come in. Uh, restaurants or subways at times, so any sort of public transportation. And so now, today, uh, after May, that is when everything has officially opened up. So I'm it's currently November, and almost everything has returned to normal uh, back in Chengdu, with the exception of many people wearing masks and uh, showing health codes. But uh, I'll, I'll conclude with this, that it's, uh, it's very interesting to be so far, over 5,000 kilometers away from home and <clears throat> so many communities that I'm a part of and connected to and to be in China and have, uh, to have a job today uh, and incredible job opportunities and have so many different experiences that have opened up, yeah. And if any follow-up questions, I'm happy to answer. Right. Thank you so much, Oni. And again, thank you for being with us uh, in the wee hours of the morning there in Chengdu. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open this up now, again, considering our time for Q&A from the participants. So if you're attending and you'd like to share a question or have a question either for all of the panelists or for a specific gateway program, please just go ahead and share it. The easiest way to do this is to go um, into the chat box, the chat window of the Zoom. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you should see an option to click chat and that can open up for you. And um, I'll manage directing the questions to our panelists. I'll give everyone a moment to think. Okay, I'm gonna throw one out there um, to see who would like to respond to this. Anyone is welcome for this one. Um, you've all kind of referenced, right, like how slow the United States has been in its response. Slow being a very kind and generous word, um, doing a lot of work, right? Um, so what have you seen change? Like one of the things we really value in global education is our students getting um, perspectives from different parts of the world and kind of breaking past uh, their own, you know, perspective and being able to understand where others are coming from. How has this changed views of the United States or has it just deepened views of the United States that have already existed? Um, anyone want to take that? I'm kind of staring at Hilda since this is a little bit of her, <laughs> right? Like you work on American exceptionalism, yeah. so, but anyone. <laughs> I think unfortunately at this point, everyone in Norway is uh, uh, disappointed but not surprised at how the United States is acting, but that's a four year long exercise now. Um, and so, <laughs> It, I mean, Norway is very, very concerned with, you know, multilateral cooperation and venerates the UN and the WHO. And, and so any, whenever our biggest ally, the United States, undermines these institutions, it leads to panic. Um, so in that sense, the, the pandemic response has been a, a low point uh, from our perspective, unfortunately. Yeah, um, we have another question uh, here about how consistent is compliance with governance, government directives? Are there pockets of resistance, right? And this has become something that's really famous in the United States as well, pocket of resistance to masks. I will share that yesterday I saw somebody write, um, I don't believe in masking. And I also saw somebody write on a webinar I was watching, like, please take off your mask, you just look stupid. Um, Right. And here in Washington, we're going into another four week period, at least of increased restrictions. So, yeah. How how are people responding? 
Are they following directives? I mean, I hear in Namibia, there's police out here. This is like strongly suggested, right? right. Um, yeah, it's what is it like in your places? Kevin. In Trinidad and Tobago, the mask wearing has been instituted from the beginning. And we even have government of, um, legislature that you can be charged if you're not wearing your mask. And people have been charged, you know, and they posted up on the television that thousands of people have been charged today. You know, a mask costs 10 TT dollars and the charge is a thousand TT dollars. Which one do you prefer to pay? You know, and understanding how small we are and how close we are in proximity to each other, you need to wear a mask. Like you people, do, if you don't wear a mask, you can't get in a store, it's up on the door. And if you go into a store and someone doesn't have on your mask, you're like, what are you doing? Put your mask on, you know? People are very, the, the, the community has really rallied around that support and we are not seeing those pockets of resistance. So like, um, like Hilda, we are very, very surprised and alarmed by what was taking place in the US. Um, maybe I can just um, quickly talk about the reaction of the people. Uh, I think people understood the, the impact of COVID-19 and um, for instance, the wearing of, of, of masks is, is compulsory. However, there was a time, uh, especially um, um, middle enterprises and uh, like street vendors, if I have to put it that way, that were bitterly complaining about being excluded from from the market because now you would have uh, big shops that are open and uh, people that are really like uh, small and medium um, enterprises were closed. So there was in fact even a, a sort of a, a protest coming from them that if you can allow Woolworths or ShopRite or whatever shop to, to, to operate, you must also allow us to operate. So people started weigh, weighing between their livelihood because it really affected their livelihood and, um, and, 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 and being infected. And they were even saying, if you don't allow us to, to, to trade, uh, uh, afraid that COVID will kill us, instead uh, hunger will kill us. So um, as time went, the measures were relaxed and they, they were allowed to operate. Um, but currently, uh, we can quite say, uh, say that the country is open, but the uh, people still have to observe uh, the health protocol. So otherwise, generally, people understand uh, the impact of, of, of COVID-19. Mommy, you're muted. There we go. Thank you. You would think I'd be used to this by now, but no. Um, so we have one more question coming in about celebrations uh, like carnival or spring festival. How do they move from public squares to home personal events without the regular social networks? They can't imagine Trinidad and Tobago without carnival in any form. I know for me, we're in the midst of Indian holiday season. So we've gone through like two big holidays now. Um, that have been kind of lonely, right? I mean, we we video chatted with family. It was uh, right, but yeah. How does that look, Candice? Do you want to take that? Absolutely. Um, definitely, things have moved to online. It's going to be extremely different. We are a culture where we meet and we hang out and we celebrate our traditions and our culture. And we are not going to be able to do that in the same way. The government is right now still working out how that is going to happen. Um, if it's going to happen just in, in country, if we're just going to do carnival celebrations here. And they've kind of been holding that over the heads of the population. Like, if you behave, if all goes well, if the numbers go down, just maybe we'll do something on a, re, on a local level. And so people have been trying to really adhere to the protocols, but I think if not, we are going to still find creative ways of celebrating who we are, because that's just what we do. I, um, I, I see this is happening in chat right now, but one of the Oslo alums, Bailey Forsyth is asking Hilda if um, she could speak to what is the international reaction of Biden winning the presidential election, not to completely change topics, but maybe we could tie that into reaction to the pandemic. Um, 
And yeah, I think we'll start with Hilda, but if we have a minute or two, we can. I can I, I'm only going to speak about Norway, um, but I think here, given how dependent we are on, on the U.S. for our, our security policy, uh, it's been walking on eggshells for four years and holding our breath and hoping the nightmare would end. Uh, and I think there's been a sort of slow, like, uh, uh, trauma, just sort of not really knowing if we could believe that, that the nightmare was over. And, and maybe this is also the case for many in the U.S., but sort of move, slowly moving through a sort of fog. And then we think maybe we're coming out on the other side and maybe we can believe that better days are ahead now. But in, in general, people are, are very, very, very happy. Does anyone else want to quickly, quickly respond to that? I can briefly jump in because I'd say most people I know in the UK are so happy and have been, you know, sick of Trump since the beginning. But there's some really interesting analysis about sort of Trump's style of leadership and the Prime Minister Boris Johnson's style of leadership. And he's been kind of called a mini Trump or a lesser Trump. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're interested, Google it in The Guardian. But some really interesting sort of opinion pieces of saying, you know, if this is before Biden won, but, you know, if Trump loses, this means that Boris is going to have to change his style of governance. And this actually makes Brexit a bit more complicated because of UK US trade relations and so on. And so it is interesting thinking about sort of these world leaders not only having to engage with each other, but also the sort of influence they have mm -hmm. um, in terms of leadership styles and obviously what happens kind of policy wise and so on. So that's something I think I wouldn't have gleaned or expected really if I hadn't been, you know, scrolling The Guardian every day. Yeah. As <laughs> election updates and so on. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Um, it's fascinating also. So I have families spread across the US, India, and Brazil, um, amongst other places. And of course, the three hardest hit places with three very similar styles of governance and leadership. And it will be interesting to see for me how Trump losing affects what they do and also affects their pandemic response, right? Like, what's possible to politicize or not anymore. With that, we are right in our last minute of time. I want to take a moment and just virtually thank, so let's do a little round of applause here. Um, this, is what, this is what happens when you have toddlers, you do a round of applause like that. Um, but to all of our panelists, um, I when this was starting, I did not think we'd be able to get everyone across all time zones at the same time. Um, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Ms. Uh, Tamara has had to run out to give another talk, so she also wanted to me to wish all of you well and to apologize for that. Thank you all also to the attendees. I know it's easy to get Zoomed out these days, um, so we appreciate you joining us today, and I hope you all have a fantastic day ahead. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.